A lot of you know uh, Justin, who's a member of our uh, student ministry, or family's part of our church. Uh, he's here with us this morning. Justin, where are you? Back there. So, thank you. Over and over, you hear me say, God, God takes ashes, right? God makes beauty come from ashes. He turns our, our mourning into dancing. He makes all things work together for good. Now, Justin has, has taken something terrible and done something uh, so beautiful, inspiring. Thank you for that. Uh, when I heard uh, the song, it, it led me to Matthew 14, the story about Jesus walking on the water. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Word of God for the people of God. So Lord, in these moments, would you speak to us? As we remember this terrible tragedy, would you comfort us this morning and strengthen us? If any this morning are, are feeling like the waves are crashing above their head, will you reach out to them in these moments? We know you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, the, the news media referred to that day as the, the Valentine's Day tragedy or massacre. Um, I'll always remember it as Ash Wednesday. It was Ash Wednesday. Uh, it's the day that we mark uh, our foreheads with ashes, reminding ourselves that it's from ashes we came and to ashes we return. It's a day that we reflect on mortality and the wages of sin. Uh, every year we have uh, an Ash Wednesday service uh, in the evening, and we were planning it for that night. We had it planned for that night. We were, were scheduled. Uh, I had run home for something. I can't tell you why anymore. Uh, late afternoon on my way to the house, which is in the direction of, of Douglas, uh, emergency vehicles were zooming past, uh, lights flashing, sirens blaring. Uh, when I got home, I opened my car door. I could hear the helicopters in the direction of the school. My neighbors were out in the yard, and I said, what's going on? They said, there's a shooting. And so I went in, turned on the TV, and at that point, it, it was, there is a shooter. And then the students were being, you know, ushered out of the school. We saw that on TV, but, but we didn't know yet. Were there injuries? Were there victims? We didn't know. And I... I know in the grand scheme of things, this is such a little thing. Um, but I, I started thinking about the service that night. Like, do, do we still have the service? Like, do we, do we need to cancel the service? Uh, is anybody going to come? And, and, then, and then I rushed back to the church, and by the time I got back here, there, we knew there were injuries. And, and then it wasn't long after that, we knew there were fatalities. 
And so literally less than an hour before the service, we were scrambling to completely redo the surface, service, knowing that maybe somebody's coming, that, that, that Ash Wednesday is not on their mind now. Literally minutes before the service, we were rewriting the sermon. Cheryl was scheduled to preach that night. I said, Cheryl, I think I got to do it. She graciously said, okay. Justin used that image, we're over our heads, right? There's sometimes you're over your head, and man, when I got up in the pulpit that night, I felt over my head. There was a news crew sitting back there that wanted to ask a question after the service. I, I, there are folks here, some of you were here, that were in the school that day, and your kids were in the school that day. And, and, and I stood up here to say something. I, not only was I really unprepared, I felt uh, inadequate, who am I in this moment to have anything to say? And what is there to say? I was over my head. Now you know that you know, none of the, the 17 who were killed or the, the 17 that were, were injured that day were, were directly connected to our church. Um, but it still seemed obvious very quickly that we were affected by this. I mean, some of, the, some of those folks were... were were classmates of yours, some of those were friends, some of those were neighbors, um, uh, some, some of you just got caught up in the schools being shut down, you couldn't get to your own kid that day, and I, I just sensed that, that, that maybe we weren't injured in this, and yet we were. Nobody living in Coral Springs or Parkland escaped at least the emotional injury of that day, the grief of that moment, the, the pain of that. There, there is this thing that I hear people say, Christians, well-meaning Christians, they say, God never gives you more than you can handle. And people quote that like it's from the Bible. Did you know it's not in the Bible? The Bible does not say that. In fact, if we could handle every moment of our lives, what need would we have of God? The, the act opposite is what's in the Bible, that we need to live every day dependent on God. Now, what's true in that statement is that God doesn't give us more than we can handle. God doesn't do that. But life does. That day, a, a troubled kid with a gun gave us more than we could handle. By the way, that's why we need God. Because sometimes this life throws us more than we can handle. Sometimes it feels like we're drowning. I think a lot of us felt it that day. Psalm 41 40, through 2 says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Sometimes it feels like we're sinking in the mud. So the story of Jesus uh, goes that he'd been teaching and that he needed some time alone in prayer. So he, he put the disciples in a boat and he sent them out on the Sea of Galilee to head over to the other side of the sea. Didn't really explain how he was going to catch up with them, just that he would. And so he goes up on the mountain by himself to pray, which, by the way, I think is how he kept his neck above the water. I mean, think about Jesus. He was constantly criticized. He was, he was constantly under attack. They were plotting against him. His entire ministry, he knew the cross was coming. The way he kept his head above water was he spent a lot of time with the Father. We may want to pay attention to that. And so late that night, the disciples are, are, are working their way across the lake, and it says the wind was against them, and the waves were getting higher. And then all of a sudden, they see this human figure walking across the water, and not knowing that Jesus could do that, they assumed what? It's a ghost. I mean, what, what reasonable explanation is there when you see someone walking across the water? It's a ghost, and so it says they cried out in fear. Their first response was fear. 
You ever noticed how close fear is to the surface of our lives? How quickly you know, life seems to be just going along normal and just we scratch the surface. <gasps> And we recognize we're carrying around a lot of fear and anxiety, understandably. And I'm guessing for most of us, what happened a year ago has only increased that reality in our life. They cried out in fear. Jesus calls back to them, take courage. It is I. Do not be Afraid. I mean, that's the truth. There was nothing in that moment for them to be afraid of. And yet, we live, all of us, they, us, they, we live in the state of anxiety. Do not be afraid. Scripture tells us that over and over. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. All of a sudden, the, the, the story takes this bizarre twist. Peter, who always was saying and doing the most impulsive things, sees Jesus walking in the water. Well, if Jesus can do it, then maybe I can do it. So he steps out of the boat, and he actually manages to take a few steps on the water. But then he takes his eye off of Jesus. And he puts it on the wind, and he puts it on the darkness, and he, he focuses on these big waves, and immediately he starts sinking like a stone. And verses 31 and 30, 30 and 31 say, When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, and he cried out, say it with me, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? <laughs> really, Jesus? I mean, really? I'm sinking. The waves are crashing over my head. Why? Why do I doubt? <laughs> really? Any doubts this year? I mean, this made me doubt the system. Where were the people that should have caught on that something was wrong with this young man? How did he fall through the cracks? It made me doubt. It made me doubt our politics. Once again, we, you know, we, we go back to the political issues and we, we go up to Tallahassee and we go up to D.C. This time it's going to change. Never again. I doubted it. As I stood up that night and in the weeks after, I doubted me, my, my capacity to be the pastor of that moment, and I certainly doubted God. I, I want to be really clear this morning. I, I don't want to make this about me. Um, I, I, I was not directly impacted by that event other than trying to be here for all of you, but I was drowning in the weeks and months that followed. That incident put me over my head. That, 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 that day, the events of that day, forced me to face fears and doubts that I didn't even know I had. It put me in a place where I had to see whether or not my faith in God was sufficient, and often it was not. Parkland certainly wasn't the first tragedy of this kind. It wasn't even the first of 2018 or the last. The month I moved here was the Pulse nightclub shooting, which just happened a short distance from the neighborhood I grew up in, down the street from my home church. It didn't affect me. I was a campus minister at FSU when the Virginia Tech shooting happened. It was tragic, but it didn't, it didn't affect me. I remember Sandy Hook, I remember Columbine, and all of those times, like if we, we needed to talk about it, I had, I had answers, you know, to talk about free will and freedom of choice and, and, and that responsibility and the reality of sin and that we live in a fallen world, and I still believe all that's true, but somehow saying those words to people right in your own community that have seen the horror firsthand, all of a sudden those, those easy, tried and true theological answers sounded hollow to me. They just sounded like something you write on an essay in seminary. It didn't sound like it was a truism to help put your feet on the solid rock. And I struggle with that. I was confused. I bet you were too. I was angry. I was afraid. 
and I was thinking. And I think when we're in that kind of a situation, we have a choice. When we find our, 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 our faith, our beliefs challenged to a way that we're not sure what to do with them, we can either dig deeper or give up. And I'll be honest, if I had not been your pastor, I might have given up. If not for the responsibility of standing up here every week, I might have just thrown in the towel. It's not that easy, is it? So you know I'm a reader. When I I don't have the answers, I go find a book. That's kind of what I do. It's not the only thing I did, but I I turned to to several authors. One of them was Elie Wiesel, who was a Holocaust survivor. Um, And I figured if he can get through the Holocaust and not lose his faith, then maybe he has something to say to me. In his autobiography, All All Rivers Run to the Sea, he writes, The suffering and death of innocent children inevitably places divine will in question and arouses men to wrath and revolt. But what if that were just what God intended? That men and women cry out to him of their pain and disappointment. Sometimes we must accept the pain of faith so as not to lose it. And if that makes the tragedy of the believer more devastating than that of the non-believer, so be it. I think what he's saying is we have a choice. When tragedy happens, whether it's a, 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 a huge, horrific thing like, like what happened at Douglas, or, or whether it's just something that happens personally in our lives, I think we have a choice. Either we cry out to God in our pain in faith, or we cry out in despair. I mean, it's one or the other, right? It's either cry out knowing somebody is there to listen or crying out to what? And here's the good news. I think God hears it either way. Remember that line back in Exodus when God's people are slaves in Israel and he says to Moses, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out. seems like any time something tragic happens, whether it's personal or, 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 or bigger, we start asking those hard questions that there just aren't answers for, like why would God let this happen? How could a good God let this happen? Why didn't God stop it? I mean, those are all the things that we wish we knew, we understood, or that we think is right. And I start asking those questions too. I don't think I'd asked those questions before, but I started asking them. And honestly, my beliefs weren't cutting it. I don't know if this is going to make sense, but if you would just bear with me for a moment. Again, I don't want to make this about me. I'm just telling you a story, so maybe maybe you can connect to it. But in the days after the shooting, I, I I had some very kind friends and colleagues call me and and, you know, just as pastor to pastor, and they they said, Listen, Vance, we're just I'm I'm here for you. We're praying for you. I was was thankful for those people. And a couple of them very, with with the best of intentions, I think, meaning to just encourage me, said, Vance, we know that God has you there for this moment. That God sent you to Coral Springs just for this. And and I, I don't know if they meant it this way, but what I heard was, Back in 2016, uh, when you got the call, you were moving to Coral Springs, that God already knew this was going to happen and that he's arranging the events of your life so that you'll be there when this happens. And so God, God orchestrated your moving there for this moment, and I would not accept that. Because if that's true, then why wasn't God 
orchestrating the events of this young man to make sure he never got his hands on a gun? And why, was the, why wasn't God orchestrating the events to make sure that, that somebody didn't stop him from going into that school? And, and, and a whole host of other questions. And for me, I've described it, it was a lot like dominoes falling. All of a sudden, well, I don't believe God sent me here for that. And well, do I really believe God sent me here? And do I really believe God has sent me anywhere? And do I really believe that God calls people and do I really believe anything that I've ever heard from God is is true and do I really believe God and I'll be honest that last domino just teetered for the longest time I, I think the core of the questioning for me was do I believe God speaks I used to believe that. Do, do, I, do I believe that God you know, speaks to people, their, their purpose, and, and, and directs their footsteps, as Scripture says? Do I believe that? And that was hanging right here. Like, either I believe that or I don't. And I'll tell you, after a lot of prayer and after digging deep and after pursuing people that I believe are wise, I, I, I've come to believe this. I believe God does speak but most of the world isn't listening I believe it's entirely possible that that day God was very vocal speaking to that young man do not do this put the gun down do not do this but maybe he wasn't listening maybe his brokenness didn't Allow him to listen. I, I, I have to wonder if God was speaking that day and in weeks and months prior to, 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 to teachers, to his family, to the administration, to, to, to social service people saying, help this kid, get this kid the help he needs, stop this. And maybe nobody was listening. I wonder if maybe part of the problem we're having, the reason it feels like the world is sinking, is that too few of us are listening. God is screaming to us, and we're listening to everything but. Another writer I turned to was Richard Rohr. He said, God is seldom in charge, it seems to me. We always want to blame it on God, right? He says, God is seldom in charge, it seems to me, only in the lives of saints, only in people who know themselves and, and love the Lord and one another is God possibly then in charge. And the rest of us, God is in charge maybe a few minutes a day. It's because we're not paying attention. So Peter gets out of the boat, he takes his few steps, and he starts sinking, and he calls out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? Now, I want you to notice something in this story. When Peter gets this harebrained idea to start walking on water, Jesus doesn't say, whoa, 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 not a good idea. Stay in the boat. Want to walk out on the water? Walk out on the water. Notice the moment that, that, that he starts to doubt and starts to sink. Jesus doesn't go running over. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. It's okay. You won't get your feet wet. I gotcha. He lets them sink. Now, I don't get that, right? I mean, how many times do we wish Jesus would intervene? Whoa, 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 don't, don't let this thing happen. Don't, but where, where would you draw the line? I mean, that's the challenge, right? We, we want God to stop and not let anything bad ever happen. But where would you draw the line? In ways I can't begin to understand, God allows, right? But then Peter cries out, Lord, save me. 
Jesus reaches down and lifts him up. I mean, here's reality, friends, and you know it. There are times when, when what we thought was solid ground becomes mucky clay and we start singing, the sinking. There, there are times that we are unprepared and the flood waters start rising. There are times when the waves come and they are just too big and they start crashing over our heads. And Jesus doesn't say, whoa, wave, stop it. He doesn't just push the water down, but he does stand above the water. The one who walks on water reaches down to us while we're sinking and he pulls us up. He's bigger than the waves. He's bigger than the flood. If you want to go anywhere in the Bible to wrestle with the question of suffering and why bad things happen to good people, I don't know of anywhere better than Job. Not an easy book, but it wrestles. For 37 chapters of Job, Job and his friends debate and debate and debate about why bad things have happened to Job and why bad things happen to other people and this is why and this is why and this is why and then finally God shows up. And for four chapters, God, God speaks to Job and says, now, now, I've got some answers for you, but here's the problem. The answers aren't answers, they're questions. He doesn't answer any of the questions they've been wrestling with for 37, 37 chapters. All he does is pose more questions to Job that are unanswerable. His point being, I'm God and you're not. Ask your questions, right? You know, form your theological theories. At the end of the day, I am God, and you are not. In biblical times, they believed in monstrous sea creatures called Leviathan. That's why they were often afraid out on the water. They believed these sea monsters were under the deep and would come and devour you at any moment. They saw ships go out to sea and not come back. Why? Because they were attacked by Leviathan, probably. Well, in this, this answer of God to Job, he refers to the Leviathan. I, I didn't know, I've read this, I don't know how many times, but in my struggling, I found it again. And it says this, can you, Job, catch Leviathan with a hook, meaning a fishing hook, or put a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it with a rope through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy and implore you for pity? Will it agree to work for you, to be your slave for life? And this is the part that I just think is funny. Can you make it a pet like a bird? Or give it to your little girls to play with? Well, of course, the answer is no. Job wasn't quite capable of turning a leviathan into a house pet. But God is. God's bigger than the flood. God's bigger than the waves. God's bigger than the storm. God's bigger than the Leviathan. God's bigger than the tragedies of your life, my life, of our community. God is bigger. He stands above the waves. And he reaches down when we need him most. So Jesus lifts up Peter and he places him in the boat and Peter falls to his knees and says, say it with me, truly you are the son of God. When long before that he was crying out, it's a ghost. Truly you're the son of God. You are the one who stands on the waves and reaches down and lifts me up and places my feet on solid Ground. I don't know what this year has done to you and your faith. I don't know what you might have struggled with, what your fears might be, your spiritual insecurities. I don't know if it was Parkland that's been playing with your heart or something a little closer to home for you. I don't know. But I want to say to you today, I don't have answers for why these terrible things happen. Um, I, I, I don't because there aren't any. But I'm convinced that God is real, that God is good, 
While he may not stop the wave from crashing down upon us, he hears us when we cry. Help. And he reaches out and takes our hand and lifts us up. Do you need him this morning to lift you up? Just reach out. He's the son of God. So Lord, we are, we are still in the beginning of this long healing process. An anniversary doesn't make the pain go away. In fact, it makes it worse. So Lord, pray for these families that were so directly impacted. Heal their hearts. Lord, comfort their pain. Lord, take us to deeper place of faith that even though we may not know the answers, we still know you. For anyone, Lord, this morning, struggling, struggling, feeling like they're sinking, Lord, we're there a lot. It feels like we're barely keeping our nose above water so much of the time. If there's anybody afraid this morning, Lord, help them look up and see your hand reaching down. Lift us up, Lord. In Jesus' name.